So, hi everybody, um, I'm JJ. He already told you the first two places you should look for when hiring were the third, so I'll get a little bit into that. Um, but just first, before we even get into any of this, show of hands, who here has shipped a feature before? Okay, so I'm gonna tell you stuff you already know. No, just kidding. Um, what I will be telling you is at least our approach to things and my approach to things. Definitely curious after the talk and then like well after when we're eating pizza and drinking beer to hear what you guys do that's different, better, worse um, than us. So, let's get started. I'm JJ, uh, like Dan said, co-founder and CTO of WayUp. So what is WayUp? WayUp is the largest marketplace for college students and recent grads to find part-time jobs, internships, and full-time entry-level jobs after school. So if you're looking for engineering interns, if you're looking for people part-time, if you're looking for full-time, uh, we do all of that for just out of school. We have, we're only two years old, but we're at over 4,100 campuses, so every school you've ever heard of, every school you've never heard of, I'm in 9,000 employers, so everyone from huge companies like Google, Disney, Make-A-Wish Foundation, down to the pizza shop, wherever you went to school, we are probably there. Best metric is one in three students on way up gets hired, who applies. Um, it's pretty crazy for any of you who are in the HR space in any form, you know that this is, it's the thing I'm most proud of about this company. So, that being said, pitch is over. You can talk later over beer. How do we build features? So I have this really scientific framework that I made up over a lot of time building them. This is how my team and we go through and think about what we're gonna do and how we do it. So collect needs, assess, prioritize, spec, build, deploy, and measure. And throughout this talk, we're gonna go through all these steps um, and how we think about them. So the truth is, I present that as originally as a line, but I think as all of you know, especially the places that do more of an agile type framework as opposed to waterfall, I wouldn't say we're either, but just to put those on two ends of the spectrum, that's really not how it works, and it's definitely not how it works with us. The truth is, we have a bunch of shit going on at once. I hope I can curse, because I just did. So we have a bunch of stuff going on at once. We're collecting needs, we're assessing how important those things are, we're prioritizing, we're finding out our priorities are wrong, and then recollecting needs, because how do we mess that up in the first place all at the same time? And then once all that is done, or even when it's not done, we then go back into this cycle at the bottom where we build, deploy, measure, spec, spec, deploy, build, measure, I know those things don't make any sense, it's all at the same time, and that's kind of the point. Um, you can do all this at the same time. I mean, you can have a good process, it's just called being extremely iterative, and if you wanna use the more formal name, you can do it as part of continuous integration. So, to start, collecting needs. So, in English, what that actually just means is com coming up with ideas for what we should be building. That can be anything from, this is an awesome feature that we need because our customers are hurting, our users are hurting, on the other end, it could be this is a critical bug that we need to fix right now. It could be this is cool and we wanna give it a shot. So the biggest thing that I've learned, um, and I stole this a little bit from my Combinator, is talk to your users. Now what's important about this is it doesn't mean do what your users say. So I think any of you who are customer facing at all know that often users don't really know what they want. Um, but it does mean pay attention to your users' needs. So you should talk to them in person as much as you can or just talk to them in general. But more than that, it's about actually listening in the sense that I'm hearing you, I'm understanding your needs, I'm not gonna take your orders. So how do you do that? When you're a small company, um, and when I think about this, I think back to when we were two to four to even 10 people as the entire company, it's pretty simple. There's you, the person who builds. You have your users who you can directly talk to, you can email, you're probably manning the support tickets yourself. And then on the other side, you have your team, who may be other developers if you have an engineering team, maybe not if it's just you, but you're getting feedback from your team where the salesperson is saying, hey, my customer tried to pay and literally payment doesn't work. Or, um, you know, we had a user try to sign up uh, and they hate it because they don't like the color. Whatever it is, whether it's good feedback or not, you're talking directly with people. As you get a little bigger, um, whether it's bigger in the size of the team or bigger in terms of the code base, those tend to go, to be to go together you can't and probably shouldn't be talking to your users directly anymore. You're not literally going out on the street, pushing your app in somebody's face and saying like, hey, what do you think of this? Um, so your communication starts to go through your team, whether it's just indirectly and that happens organically, whether you actually start to hire a customer support specialist. Then as you get even bigger, things get really complicated where you have a support person, they talk to the PM who kinda gathers things from the team and then they tell you, but at that point, oops, payment is broken, no one bothered to tell you, and it's like just a really big mess. So really what's important when I think about as we grow, and we just hit 45 people recently, so as our team is continuing to grow, how do you keep that direct connection to your users? 
while knowing that it's not gonna actually be direct at all. So there are a couple tools that I like that we really use. First is Help Scout, and this is just, for us, this is what we use, but I'm sure all of you has some sort of ticketing platform. What to me is important is two things. One is, obviously, it enables your customer support team to respond to tickets in one place in the same place, but the even more important part for me is that it gives me visibility. I can go in at any time and see anything that anyone has ever complained to us about. Why does that matter? Because I still, like, when I take my Saturday afternoon, what I'm doing is going through support tickets. Uh, not because I'm answering them, not because I'm even fixing them, because I'm not. They go through the prioritization process that we'll get through the rest of, but it's because I just want to get a vibe. I kind of want to have my finger on the pulse of what do our users think about us, at least the ones who are talking to us. So at least that's the way I'm still able to talk to them, even if I'm not really talking back. And sometimes I do. Sometimes I just email them. The other tool I use, which I really highly encourage you to get this one if you don't have it, it's worth the money, is called Full Story. This is, it's a DVR, basically, a DVR software. It's an analytics tool you install on your site, and it basically does, it plays back for you video recordings of people on your site exactly how they use it. It has been the single best thing, I think, from a product discovery perspective that we've done, and it's to the point where I bought a TV and put it in the engineering room, and I just put full story on straight up replay for hours and hours and hours, so out of the corner of my eye, I'll be working on something, and I'll see a user like clicking something and just nothing, nothing happens, um, and we learn that, wow, our design pattern that we thought was awesome actually sucked. So that's another way that, again, I'm not talking to my users, but I am listening to them, even if it's I'm listening through rage clicks rather than an email. So as you build together all these ideas, you're gonna have a lot of ideas. Some are great, some are urgent, some are not, some are honestly gonna be kind of stupid. You still should put all of those things in a place where you can get to them later. And I bring this point up because I've seen a lot of teams that come up with lots of great ideas, gather them all, prioritize them, and then like discard the bottom half. And that's something I categorically disagree with. It's important as you're doing all this together, as you have this process, to have at least a repository of all the ideas you've ever had. Even if it's just, we use Trello for this, even if it's something like, hey, very long term for next school year because we do things on the school cycle, even if it's literally a column that says we will never do this, you'd be surprised because one day you might do it and you'll be amazed at the things you had thought of when you came up with that idea that will be important for later. This way also when you keep everything, it doesn't have to be a Trello, it doesn't even have to be in one place, but just by keeping this stuff together, you end up, you will never have an empty backlog. Uh, we've done this from the beginning, it just worked out that way, so we've never had an empty backlog, but what amazes me is in some CTO groups I'm in when we're talking about what are the problems we have, some companies have an empty backlog, like they don't know what to do next. So if you have that problem, good way to avoid that. So for the rest of this, as I'm talking, I also wanna take you through a real tangible example of a feature we built and dealt with, because I think it helps to have something a little bit more hands-on. So in this case, we're gonna be using improved job search relevancy. So what does that mean? When students log into the platform, when they log into Way Up, before they log in, before they, uh, sorry, can see jobs, they have to fill out a full Mad Lib style profile. Hi, my name's JJ, I go to Penn, I studied whatever. Because of that, we're able to show students only the jobs they're qualified for and only the jobs that are live. It also enables us to do even more than that and really show them jobs that are only relevant to them. So the MIT PhD in math may, sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't, or she, want to go to summer camp, right? So we should be collecting that information and showing them more relevant results. This is not news to anybody. What we discovered is through this needs collection, and by needs collection, I mean simply looking at Help Scout and realizing, wow, people are complaining. We had relevancy, but it just wasn't good enough, and this was something that we really urgently needed to do, or I thought it was urgent. The way I thought it was urgent is by assessing and prioritizing. So the way that I think about prioritization, there are always many, many different competing metrics. Revenue, whatever, depending on your company, user base, MAUs. No matter what it is, I try to boil it all down to one thing, one number actually, and it's impact per effort, it's a ratio. So I think about everything we're going to do, whether it's a small ticket like, hey, change this text, to a huge ticket like, hey, you should completely redo your billing model, as impact per unit effort. So what is impact and what is effort? Because I actually don't think those things are so obvious. Impact can be a bunch of things. It's whatever your company KPIs are, which are different for every company. Often revenue is one of them, but it may not be. Um, performance, I think engineering and engineering debt is included in this. So performance improvements, whether it just annoys you as a developer and you can't work well, or if it's Amazon style where every 10 milliseconds you lose $1,000, whatever that is, those are things that matter. And technical debt, as all of you know, is something that really matters. 
and it's when you're measuring impact, you have to find some way, and this scale will be different for every company, to be able to measure the value of completing and getting rid of technical debt along with actually adding a new feature. That's not something we're diving into, but on the other side, effort. I think of that as number of resources, time, are we adding complexity in the way of new architecture or anything else? And at the end of the day, you're probably sitting there and saying, wow, he's gonna literally be making up these numbers, and so his ratio is like 2.3, but what does that mean? The truth is the 2.3 doesn't matter. What matters is, for your company, the scale. So if you do this over and over and over again for every feature, this thing will be 2.3, this one will be 1.5, that one will be five. You'll start to get a good understanding for your company of what those ratios actually mean. Um, and even more importantly than that, they'll end up in some type of order. Because that's what we're actually doing here, we're prioritizing. So it doesn't matter why they're in that order, and sorry, it does matter why, it doesn't matter what the units are, as long as they're in an order that works for the company. Another thing that I really like to think about, especially when talking with the business side of the company, is that not only are deadlines, as most of you know, often kind of a guess, it's like we think it'll be done by then and we really hope it will, but who knows if we'll find a bug in you know, GCC, probably not, but maybe. Um, even these estimations of impact and effort are guesses, or probability clouds. So I think this feature will matter a lot, but I could be wrong. I'm sure all of you have done, oh yeah, this thing will be five seconds, and then like four days later, you're like, fuck. <laughs> I'm totally behind. Um, so the, way I, the questions I ask out loud to my engineering team are, what are the chances that we will achieve the impact we think we're gonna achieve? What are the chances that this is as hard as we think it is? And, that, and then what that lets us do is say, there is a 70% chance that X will be done by Y. So there's a 70% chance that this feature will be done by September 1st, 90% chance they'll be done by September 20th. What that does is it teaches the non-technical sides of the company to understand the way you think about it, which is the truth is it's a scale. It probably will be done, but probably isn't definitely. And a lot of people here probably and think yes, um, and that's just not how it is. This is language that's worked for us. Especially giving two examples, by the way, because now you realize, okay, he just said September 1st, it's September 1st. The other thing that's nice about this and this whole process is that it actually enables you to have multiple estimates for the same thing. And you may be asking, okay, well, how the feature takes as long as it takes. And the truth is that's not the case. If you remember, it's not just a linear order of, we didn't even get to specking yet, right? We're still guessing. I, I actually like to estimate before we spec, which sounds a little bit crazy. And the reason is, when we're sitting together on my executive team that works on technology and product and the business side, and we're trying to see what's important, we're assessing, one of the things we do is say, okay, there's this feature. Let's take, for example, this relevancy system. There are a couple ways we can do it. It's on a range from hacky, but will kind of be out there, to really, really well done, but will take a long time. And as we said, the estimation, the amount of effort, all of those things are guesswork. So rather than just prioritize it once, let's actually prioritize it three different times in three different ways. We could try to take a guess on how the really, really hard version that will be the most impactful, maybe the medium version that's medium impactful, um, and then the easy version that kind of doesn't do a whole lot. And that way, if we start on one and realize that our assessments were totally wrong, we've actually already assessed other variants of the exact same thing that can get us that one step forward. So, assessing. How do you actually assess? Um, and we were talking about these like made up numbers. What are you actually using? So, to start, analytics. One example are people dropping off in a funnel. It's an easy one. Testing, and I don't mean unit testing or integration testing. What I mean is what we've done in the past is, here's a good example, import resume. We wanted to offer students the ability to import their former PDF resumes that they'll never use again to their way up profile, which hopefully they're using from then on. Um, but will people actually use it? So the first thing I did is I put a button on their profile that said import their resume, import your resume, little tooltip came up that said coming soon. And just by measuring how much do people engage with that button, we can actually assess does this thing matter without building anything. Okay, we built one line of code. Not too bad. Next is talk to your team. And I keep bringing this up because it's really important and often gets lost. Your team, meaning yes, your developers, but also the rest of your team, your sales team, your customer support team, and obviously your marketing team, your operations team, they all know way more than you, most of the time about your users. Because you're so into the product, you know it so well, you, you can't. You can't possibly get that outside perspective that they have. Um, so it's really important to talk to them, both to get the metrics like what percentage of the user base is complaining about X, Y, Z, but also just to talk to them because something will come up in a random conversation in the hallway, or if you just sit them down for coffee, that they think is a feature that you are like, holy shit, that is not supposed to work that way. 
That, ha that happened to me this morning, literally. So um, <laughs> that's also a good source of needs collection. Another one is talk to experts. Um, way up, me and my co-founder are huge on cold emailing people in our field or in whatever we're trying to learn about. The worst that happens is they don't respond. So a good example is we had really, really big questions about email marketing that we needed answered. We cold emailed people who know this stuff, like Guy Kawasaki, who is a world-class expert in marketing, people at Pinterest and other companies that send a ton of email. Um, the tech world is really friendly, as you can tell by the fact that Firstmark is even doing this at all and that Bamboo is sponsoring it. They want to help. The worst that happens is, the, um, the worst that happens is you don't get an answer. The best that happens is, and I know this sounds cliche, but it's for real, the best that happens is your company is transformed because they tell you something you never could have learned otherwise, um, and also maybe you build a new relationship. And finally, just guess, because this is software and we just made all this shit up last year, right? Everything is so new, we don't actually know what's going on. Don't tell anybody outside of that, I know they're publishing this video. Um, sometimes you just have to guess, and I think one of the big parts of why we think in the way that we do, everything I've said until this point, is sort of institutionalizing the guess as an okay thing, What's not okay is to guess and say it to your team as this is a fact. It's okay to do that to customers maybe, but not to your team. Um, but if you can build a culture of educated guesswork, and that's really what this is, it becomes not only, not only something that people are comfortable with, but actually empowering for your team. Because it lets you take risks and understand just exactly how risky they are. So, assessing effort. We did impact. How about effort? Um, I have this really scientific formula here. The truth is that I think effort more than anything else, everyone has their own way of doing it. Um, and I actually think it's for a very different and probably worse reason than impact. Impact is different for every company because every company is different. We measure ourselves on applications, how many students are getting hired. The way Apron who's presenting later is probably assessing revenue and food and people not dying. Um, for actual effort, I don't think that software engineering effort and estimation is a solved problem. There are a lot of approaches to it. There's point poker, there's whatever, what have you. Um, I think every company just has to figure out what works well for them until they grow a bit and have to change it all again. What's most important is, again, the comfortability with being wrong, the comfort with being wrong. You get it wrong and get better. And the team's comfort and everybody's comfort with the idea that you're just not gonna be right and you're totally cool with that. And the point is to get it wrong quickly so you get better. So, prioritization. At the end of the day, we talked about impact for unit effort. My goal when I'm putting together this whole list of what we're gonna do and what order we're gonna do it in is to have the most impact in the least time with the least technical debt to the company. And I think if you need one thing to focus on, if you need that like focal point of what am I actually trying to do here when I'm putting these cards in order, that's what it comes down to. So let's take this real example um, that I gave you guys of job relevancy, impact. All of these have asterisks, because again, a lot of them are guesses. We think it's gonna be really big. Um, the reason we think that is helping students find jobs is the thing that we do, that's our core. So if we're not doing that as well as we could be, we're doing something wrong. We know that some users need better results. I know that because I've seen the tickets myself. Um, and we have data with the way that our own metrics work. We know that better results means to more applications, which means to improvement in a bunch of our KPIs. Revenue, applications itself is a KPI. On the effort side, it's probably very hard. The reason I think it's probably very hard is like I actually don't even know when we're starting this what we would even do, so that probably makes it a hard problem because I just, no one knows. Um, we may not have enough data to really data science it well, if you will, to do good ML. Um, we may not even have the right architecture, so we have Elasticsearch. Is that the right tool for this? Is it gonna be fast enough? All these unknowns. So the next step, now that we've done all this stuff, now we gotta stuck it, we actually gotta build it, um, and we kinda do those at the same time. So I would break this down. The one thing we do do in order with specking is we do product spec, architecture spec, and kickoff. And what those actually translate to are these questions I have on the right side. First is product spec, what, what is this thing? Like, what are we building? You actually have to ask that question because the bigger you get, the more people will have different implicit ideas of what you're actually doing. Second is architecture. We've decided what we're doing, how are we actually going to do it? And then the third is, okay, we said what we're doing, we said how we're gonna do it, we're on the same page, let's just really make sure we're on the same page. Because the truth is, you will go through at least one time, you all agree on a big feature, and it turns out you had totally different ideas of what you were about to do. You wanna find that out before you build, not after you changed all your infrastructure. 
actually one point at the bottom. To me, specs are not about, this is not about planning everything ahead, as you can probably tell from everything I've said in this talk. I think we just don't know, we're not going to know. So rather than the goal be, this is exactly what we're gonna do and how we do it, the point is just having a plan, and that's a philosophy we take with pretty much everything we do in the company. We always have a plan. The plan is just changing all the time. But at any given time, there is something that everyone in the company is focused on, knowing that that may change tomorrow if it has to. So product spec. Uh, this doesn't dictate implementation. It's not as a rule, it just is how it tends to work out. Um, the most important thing is actually that it's readable by humans. Humans being people, your developers, everyone else on your team, even the business side. What I aspire to from the product perspective, we don't necessarily write formal user stories in the traditional sense, but I want to, and we're working on this, being able to let anyone in the company just come look at, uh, we use Clubhouse at our product tracking tool and look at any ticket and like have a pretty good idea of what's going on. And it's not just, it's transparency is awesome, but even more than that, just from a selfish perspective, it enables you to collect needs better. Because someone on sales will look at your, at your product tool and say, hey, you're working on this feature, but I see it's prioritized last, and actually it's really important. And you're not gonna know if you don't ask, or if they don't see this and tell you. So, architecture spec. Um, this is, for a lot of people here, I know for me this is one of the really interesting parts, when you take this really challenging problem and you say, how are we actually gonna put this together? Um, what are we gonna use? Do we need new servers? Do we need, how complex is this gonna be? Um, again, this is very, very different for every situation, so as much as it's the thing I'd like to dive into the most, I think it's so radically different for every company depending on where you have and what you're trying to do. That the thing I would focus most on is something that most of you probably already do. Solve the problem you have today, but do think a couple steps ahead. The bigger you get, the less you can afford to only focus on today's problem. Um, but I like keeping that in the back of my mind because it's, it's really nice when you knew that some big thing was gonna change later and you're like, yes, we took care of that already. My favorite example, when we first started the company, I had a feeling one day we would have agencies that would wanna use the platform to hire students across many different campuses and they would need to do it on behalf of many different companies. So we built it so that one user could have multiple companies attached. Small thing in the beginning um, would have been horrible to change two years later Thank God we did that. Obviously there are other things we got wrong. We don't speak about this. So, initial architecture. Let's take this example that I've been going through with you guys, job search relevancy. Here's the initial architecture. Um, this plan that I was really excited about was put together by our intern for the summer, um, who we hired, PhD in computer science from University of Texas at Austin, hired on way up. Um, he put together this pretty awesome plan, pulling data from Postgres, processing it through Lambda and storing it in Redis, um, using WordNet to, if you're familiar with NLP at all, there isn't so much structured data in a job listing, so being able to really understand how similar or different are these jobs based on the, on the limited amount of text you have alone, um, and then using it later via Elasticsearch for real-time scoring. Again, your specs can constantly evolve as you build. There's the quote I said before. Um, we'll get to why this matters in a second. So we have this architecture I'm really excited about. We get started working on it. And then we go into this cycle of we have a plan, we start to build, hopefully we deploy some of it, we measure it. So build. Build as little as possible, prototype, adjust your plan as you learn. This is a mistake we made while starting to build this feature. We built too much before pushing and really trying out anything. We got really, really quite a bit of the way through before we realized that, spoiler, something was not right. Deploy. The way we treat deploy is similar to the way we treat everything else I've said in this talk. Um, do it quickly and know you're gonna be wrong. So for me the metric is, especially as we've gotten bigger and have more and more users who really rely on us, you wanna try things out, you wanna take risks. You also don't wanna break your product. Right, and for us our website is our product. So we deploy anything that is neutral or incremental to the user experience. Notice that's not the same thing as done. So we'll deploy things, like that button to import your resume, we'll deploy things that are not done as long as they're not worse. And we learn a lot from doing that because that's what enables us to do things like deploy a button that doesn't work yet. It's what enables us to deploy a brand new feature that has a lot of moving parts and like half of it is actually not built, but no one knows and no one is going to notice. And if they do notice, you have a way to pull it back, but they won't. So we realized that we had a problem, um, Elasticsearch, was just too slow for what we were trying to do. There were a number of things in the architecture. The problem, with the solution was great, um, but there may have been something even better. And that was when we ran across graph databases, which just no one in the company had had experience with before. 
for our purposes, if we're thinking about relevancy, the Elasticsearch solution was, here's a listing, what are listings like this one? That's perfect if I don't know who you are. If you're a random person and visiting a way up page and I wanna recommend you a job like this one. But for most people, I do know who you are. I actually know a lot. And I wanna give you not just jobs like this one, but jobs like this one that are right for you. That's collaborative filtering where, well, who is like you? It's probably people who have the same major, maybe go to the same school, maybe not, who maybe apply to the same types of jobs, which we just saw before with this other architecture. Um, so we realized, holy shit, we should be using a graph database instead. Um, that is a completely different feature in architecture from everything we had started to build. The fact that we didn't go through the cycle of deploying iteratively put us in a bind where we're committed to something that was great, but not the best, when that is our core competency. So now we're at a point where we're using the solution that we have, it works well, students get great results, but we know we can do better, so we're taking a lot of time to rebuild it again with a graph database. It's not a terrible, like, world is ending story, but it is a lesson to me that if I just followed my own rules, we maybe would have that graph database today. So, measuring. You've built something, you're pushing it out, hopefully you built just a part of it and deployed just a piece of it, um, so that you could measure it before you do anything else. How do you measure? There are a zillion different tools. These are the ones we use, it is a lot. Everything from amplitude and mixed panel for just measuring analytics events, A-B testing, we use Visual Web Optimizer, um, full story I already told you guys about, server metrics, but also regular just application metrics and things like New Relic and Datadog. We actually send things like application count per day um, as a metric to Datadog and I get alerted via Datadog if, uh, if people aren't applying. That could be a server problem. It also could be a product problem. It could be the fact that it is the last week in August. But no matter what, I'm going to know that and I have really good visibility into our KPIs as a result. Just saying questions again. Um, and then finally, so we have this whole cycle of spec, build, deploy, measure. Now we come back to spec again, and for me, specking is an ongoing process, as I've said. The most important thing as you're, as you're doing this is over-communicating with everyone involved. So for me, just do this until you win. So final thoughts on this. If there's anything I could have you guys leave this talk with, just a few of the key highlights from this. So remember that to me, it's not a linear order of how you build. It's kind of two giant jumbles, and that's really okay. Pay attention to your users. Prioritize impact per unit effort. Estimates are probability clouds. Specs are about being organized. It's not about actually knowing everything that's going to happen. Your specs can change, and just because something isn't done doesn't mean you can't deploy it. So, you guys are awesome. Thank you, and if you have any questions, happy to answer them. All right, thank you, uh, JJ. Uh, questions? Don't be shy, all right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got a good arm, but not that good. All right, um, question about technical debt, right? So every organization has different ways of measuring and managing this, I guess. Two parts, do you, how do you ensure that technical debt is continuing to maintain? Do you assign like a certain amount of effort every sprint or every cycle to technical debt? But then related to that, how, you know, one engineer stroke of genius is someone yep. else's technical debt. <laughs> so how do you also filter that out and make sure that there's convergence around impact because that's a huge, a huge part of that? Yep, good question. So I'm gonna answer in reverse. The first question was, um, how do you make sure that one engineer stroke of genius doesn't actually take down the rest of your company? Um, to me, that just comes down, it comes down to code review and making sure that more than one person is looking at what's being deployed. So one thing I actually did leave out of here, which is a great point, I said deploy all the time. I didn't mean just deploy indiscriminately without anyone looking at it. You should still have other people looking and doing code review. It is a challenge to do that quickly and iteratively. Iter iter I can't even talk. Iteratively. Um, I think that's a challenge worth facing for your company, it's something we've done. It also can make it easier if deploying tiny bits of code. So that's the key way. Everyone should be on board with what's being pushed. That being said, how do you make sure that there's a giant pile of like steaming technical debt actually gets dealt with at some point? And to me it really is, you have to commit to treating it as a feature. For us, even in our business, the business side, when we have boards of what are the key things that we as a company need, new billing model, better relevancy, engineering tasks also go there. So things like we need to redo the job posting side of the site, not because it doesn't work, but because it sucks, that goes there. 
So how do we even get it there in the first place? We just do something informal that I, I like to call like the pain chart. Um, when you're working with something and it really totally sucks and it's really painful, you give it pain points. Um, and you get to a point where it's really, again, it's informal, it's certainly not scientific, and that doesn't matter because no one's gonna come to me, I hope you guys don't come to me later, like, JJ, you said that thing was four pain points, but it is three and a half. Um, it really doesn't matter. So as long as you're doing something and the futures are getting up there, uh, you're gonna be fixing your debt, and if you don't do it in the exact right order, exa again, no one is exact, it doesn't matter. So just getting something done. I hope that answers your question. Can you talk a little bit more about the probability clouds, especially yeah. from the impact side? I think you gave a good example of the effort, but impact and how do you use the cloud, because it's not like a point, how do you yep. use the cloud to make the prioritization decisions? So the question was... Uh, especially when clouds overlap, right? When they overlap, yeah. So let's start with probability clouds as far as impact goes. I actually think relevancy here is a good example. Um, I say that because this particular example was far from the first time we had redone, had redone relevancy. It was like the third or fourth time. And there were three or four times before when I was like, all right, this isn't good enough. We're gonna do this new thing and it'll be even better and it'll be super easy and we'll win. And obviously that didn't happen. Um, I think, uh, frankly, a lot of it is guesswork. So that's not a great answer and it's not the one you're looking for. And that's why I have the entire rest of the talk, which is I know I don't know. So what we started doing was making things smaller and testing before we did anything. Sometimes it's hard with something like relevancy to not push, or it seems hard to not just push a whole new relevancy framework, but actually what we did instead of doing that was tweaking parameters, tweaking heuristics as we went and seeing what improved and what didn't improve. We also did stuff like put buttons in the filters and make a really clear button that says, hey, here's how you can filter only on jobs that are part-time. That's a made-up example. But if enough people click that, I now know that I have more information that the length of time of the job, part-time, full-time, is an important heuristic. If we put this job doesn't require a car and nobody clicks it, or no one even hovers over it, I now know that this isn't an important heuristic, or at least I know a little bit more. So to me, it's about doing less more quickly, and that's how you, you don't sidestep the probability cloud, you still have one, um, but at least it helps you minimize the damage, in my mind. Now from overlapping clouds, I'm actually not sure quite what you meant. Oh. Ah, okay, I understand. So if you're actually, let's say you're trying to assign an actual number to something and you have different clouds, like 70% by this date, 90% by this, this date, I use expected value. That's actually how I came up with the probability cloud thing. It was, well, if we have a bunch, if we have kind of a, um, a wow, I'm missing the word right now, statistics. Whatever it is. We have a distribution, thank you. We, we, have, we have a distribution that I, maybe it's a little bit made up, but that I think of how likely it is this will happen and that'll happen. You can calculate statistics on that, which, and assign it a number, and the only thing you know is that that number is wrong, but it does tell you something. And again, we're comfortable with knowing these numbers are wrong because you're all listening to me talk, so you have to be comfortable with it. Cool. <laughs> Okay, so I was fascinated about the button and coming soon. Yeah. So how do you decide, like, uh, that's not exactly neutral, it's kind of detrimental to the side if I click the button that says come soon, but, you, know, what, you know, what's this? Um, so how do you, but I understand the value of it. How do you, I'm interested in how, how long you leave it on? Like, or do you, does everybody see it, or just a subset of the, the visitors? Yeah, that's a great question. So the first thing I would say is I disagree with you that it's detrimental. Um, I think it depends, right? If you have someone get many steps, let's say you have a sales flow, and or you're filling out like you're signing up for Quora, and you have to answer like a bunch of different things about all your interests, and you're six pains through, and then you get to the end, it's like coming soon, like screw this, I just invested a ton of time in this. If you have one button, and they click it, and they're like, oh, it's not ready yet, First, no, one, no one's gonna remember, to be honest. And then even beyond that, you've actually communicated to them that you're thinking about this feature and they may be excited about it. Like we've had people email and say, hey, when's this coming? I'm really excited for it. So I think it just is being judicious, which maybe is your second question. Who decides and how do you decide? Um, that's really a question of, it's a similar process, though not as long, where we're thinking about a feature, um, we need a way to test it. It's part of the testing phase. So how do we know, how do we assess that this is actually something we should be doing? That's one of the tools we have to assess if this is worth doing. I'm most going to do it when it's a really, really big feature that you can't break up iteratively. 
So that's why we did import resume. You can't like, you could, but I wouldn't import half a resume. You do it all, you don't do it at all. So I wanted a way to test, do people care about this? And I wanted to test it on the whole population, not a user group of five people. Hey, thank you. Cool, JJ, right. thanks so much. Thank you very much.